and welcome to another episode of the Gritty Hour. Um, I have a very special guest today who I'm very interested to learn from. I have Larry Jorgensen straight out of Louisiana. He's a writer and a journalist, and he's written a couple of books about the origin of the Coca-Cola Company. So welcome to the Gritty Hour, Larry. Thank you. It's uh, going to be a lot of fun to be here and to talk about Coca-Cola and some interesting stories that go way back to the start of Coca-Cola and the Coca-Cola bottlers around the country. Great. Well, we're happy to have you here and we're happy to learn from you. Tell us how you got into the, uh, or what got you interested in the first place about exploring the origins of Coca-Cola? Well, th there are a lot of Coca-Cola memorabilia collectors and fans and fanatics, you could call them. I'm none of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of freelance writing and realized that there were two Coca-Cola museums within driving distance of each other, one in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and one in Monroe, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's a good travel feature. So I set out to do a freelance travel feature on these two Coca-Cola museums. Mm -hmm. I went to Vicksburg, got that one, took photos and got the information, basic information. Then I went to Monroe and I happened to talk to some people who are descendants of the first people to bottle Coca-Cola. Oh. And started telling, telling me that this is all over the country what you're seeking to do and no one's done it everybody writes about atlanta georgia you know well to be uh, honest to be honest with started you started giving me yeah. some leave i actually assumed that that's where the origin was in atlanta georgia so well, that's it, why I, it was yeah and the syrup was invented there mm -hmm. actually there's a debate about that too but we'll go with that okay mm -hmm. that the syrup that, that created coca-cola was invented in atlanta um but, you know, Coca-Cola thought the idea of bottling it was really a dumb idea. And it was first bottled in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1856, 55, I'm sorry, 1855. Uh, the gentleman who bottled it, and there is, uh, they have recreated his little candy store where it all started out. Uh, he was a distributor for the Coca-Cola syrup. It would come in gallon jars, jugs, whatever. And he would uh, sell it at his soda fountain, you know, give it a, a shot of syrup and a little carbonated water and voila, you know. And then he would also sell the syrup to other pharmacies, drug stores, so forth in the area. Well, so he had access to the Coca-Cola syrup, obviously. A situation came up where he needed to have uh, sodas for a uh, particular event. It was a July 4th picnic, and he was getting bottled sodas from a little bottler in town. And as it so happened, the bottler couldn't accommodate him. And his name is Joe Biedenhardt. Joe went out to the picnic that July 4th and made lemonade for everybody. And he said, this will never happen again. <laughs> he went to St. Louis, bought some secondhand bottling equipment, brought it to Vicksburg and said, I'm going to bottle Coca-Cola. And he did. It, it was a very crude, you know, hand operated um, situation. But by golly, he bottled Coca-Cola first time. Mm. And he, the, in the book, you know, we talk about, he sent his first two cases to Atlanta to Asa Candler, who then owned Coca-Cola. And uh, Candler sent him a note back and said, that's all right. You know, but he wasn't real excited about it. And um, Joe got a little upset because Asa didn't send the bottles back. And, and oh. bottles in those days were difficult, you know. Sure. So he bottled, he bottled for five years with the only other uh, bottler that came into play during those five years in Valdosta, Georgia. There was a, um, a bottler who was bottling, you know, sarsaparilla and orange and all that stuff. And he had a friend who was a wholesale distributor for the Coca-Cola syrup. So light bulb goes on. He starts bottling Coca-Cola in Valdosta. Now, he was three years after Joe had already been doing it in Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. So those are your first two Coca-Cola bottlers. And... Uh, 
it from there, it's an interesting story as to how it actually got approved to be bottled. Well, um, let me ask you a question. Uh, compared to today's bottle, what did that bottle look like? Well, the bottle in those days, you know, they'll turn, uh, you buy a, a pop, okay? Because it was a straight bottle and it had this little rubber stopper on top of it uh -huh. that was held in by a, a, a piece of steel, hmm. uh, metal. Like that a went clamp. Into the, into I, the, I've seen those yeah. with, with the clamp on top. It's called the, yeah, it's called the Hutchison bottle. Mm -hmm. Well, it was hard to clean. And finally, the government's, whatever, food and drug or whoever they were in those days, finally said, this is not a sanitary bottle. You guys have got to do something else. Mm. So they finally went to the uh, standard uh, crown top bottle that we know now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, even in those days, you know, the, the bottles were whatever you could get your hands on. You know, the old, and there's another story, too, we could get into later about how the Coca-Cola bottle, as we know it, came about. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the step of how it's, they really started bottling it. Mm -hmm. Two attorneys in Chattanooga, Tennessee, were looking for a venture. And they thought the one attorney had been in the uh, uh, Spanish-American War mm -hmm. uh, in Cuba, had sampled a bottled beverage over there. It was uh, pineapple type. And he loved Coca-Cola. He came back to Chattanooga. He said to his buddy, we should bottle, let's get the rights to bottle Coca-Cola. So off they go to Atlanta, Georgia, and they meet with Asa Candler, who owned Coca-Cola and said, we want the rights, the exclusive rights to bottle Coca-Cola. Asa said, no, no, that, that is, that's a dumb idea. I'm worried that it'll, the quality won't be there. No, he, he just he turned, turned them down. They went back a second time, more determined than ever. Finally, after, I think Asa just wanted to get rid of him. He said, all right, your attorneys go to the hotel tonight, draw up a contract and bring it back. So the next day, they bring this contract back to be the exclusive bottlers of Coca-Cola. Asa read the contract, said, well, OK, I can give you the, give you the rights except Mississippi, because Joe was already doing it there. Mm. So he sold them the exclusive rights to bottle Coca-Cola in the United States for one dollar. Wow. And he told them at. And they say he never collected the dollar. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but he told them as they left, this is a dumb idea. If it doesn't work, don't you come crying back to me about it. Okay. <laughs> so the guys, now the guys go back to Chattanooga, you know, and they've got the rights to bottle Coca-Cola throughout the United States. Well, between the two of them, they've got $1,500. You know, uh, Thomas, it's kind of like the story of the, the, the dog chasing the car. What do you do when you catch it? <laughs> they they had caught it. Yeah. So, so they get back to uh, they get back to Chattanooga and they set up a little bottling operation. Not a very good one. The bottles were exploding. The employees were wearing um, mesh over their face to keep them. You know, and this was just was a terrible. And then you know the light went on. They said, "Wait a minute, we got the rights for the whole country." Well, guess what? Now we call it franchising. They said, let's cut this up into little pieces and let's sell the rights to bottle Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were in Paducah, Kentucky, and you wanted a bottle of Coca-Cola, well, they'd sell you a 50-mile territory around Paducah. And they, you know, $1,500, whatever it might be. And then you could bottle Coca-Cola. Now, the proviso was, of course, you had to use Coca-Cola syrup, uh -huh. kind of keep the flavor, you know. Uh -huh. Well, that's fine. So the, the new bottler in Paducah, he'd uh, get a hold of Atlanta and order, you know, a, a case of the uh, big jars of uh, Coca-Cola syrup. But the guys that sold him the territory, every time he bought syrup, they got a commission on the sale. So they, they sold the territory, but they sort of kept the money coming in, you know. Mm. And that really, when they talk about how did the Coca-Cola quote empire take off, 
It's because all these little entrepreneurs back in the early 1900s, 1905, 1904, decided they were going to try it. Mm. So they've invested their money, their time, their blood, sweat, and tears, you know, into selling the product called Coca-Cola. So that's, and that's why it took off. That's know? like the origins of franchisees as we know them today. Exactly. Yeah, same exactly. Business model, yeah. And of course, the guys, the guys who sold them the territory, and like in most businesses, you know, two partners eventually they parted ways mm -hmm. peacefully, but they divided the country. One of them took the southern part of the country, the other took the north, and they went on their their ways. And each of them sold franchises, and each of them became extremely wealthy mm -hmm. with this project. Um, so well, th that's how it took off. Well, let me ask you before we go forward. Um, is it a rumor or is it a, any factual story about cocaine and Coca-Cola? I wish I had in front of me a hundred dollar bill for every time I've answered that question. <laughs> um, the original formula for Coca-Cola is the cola nut and the coca leaf. Yes, mm -hmm. they make cocaine from the coca leaf, mm -hmm. but it was not processed that way to make Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Now, there was um, a slight residual, because it's a coca leaf, that they could detect what would be comparable to co cocaine in it, a slight amount. And finally, it got to be such an urban rumor that Asa Candler spent thousands and thousands of dollars, hired pharmacists and who knows what all, to finally make sure that they would never find a trace of anything that resembled cocaine in Coca-Cola. So yeah. that was in the 1920s. He accomplished that and it hasn't, there hasn't even been a trace since then. But right. it wasn't enough, you know, what what gets you the Coca Cola hooked on Coca Cola is the unique flavor of it. No, I don't work for Coca Cola, and <laughs> I'm not addicted to it. But I'll tell you what, it's different, and that, that's what's kept it going. You know, a good example. Mm -hmm. Remember the uh, Coca Cola messed up. Remember when they came out with the new Coca Cola? Yes, they changed the flavor. Yes, yeah. They, yeah, and they played with that for two years, and nobody liked it. Yeah. The story to that. You remember there was this thing called the Pepsi Challenge. Mm -hmm. And Pepsi was challenging people. They'd have two unmarked glasses and you'd go up there and sample. And which one did you like? A lot of people liked the Pepsi. And it was driving Coca-Cola crazy. So they reformulated and they came out with the new Coca-Cola. What they didn't realize is that of the two drinks... Pepsi's sweeter. So if, if you've got two unmarked glasses in front of you and you take a little sip out of each one, probably your natural reaction most of the time is to go with the sweeter one. But if you're going to drink that whole glass, what are you going to go with? You're going to go with the flavor of Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Coke never realized why they were losing the competition. And they come out with a new Coke I had Coca-Cola distributors tell me that uh, the, their delivery man would be in the grocery store, you know, delivering the new Coca-Cola. And little old ladies would come up to him and say, if you don't get my Coca back, I, I'll take this umbrella to you, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but it took Coca-Cola two years and who knows how much money and promotion to try to get us to drink the new Coke. Yeah, it no, didn't work. Yeah. yeah, it was a, it was like a lead lead balloon that went over, like yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But getting back to the eighteen hundred, when when they first marketing marketed that, getting back into the nineteenth century again, um, didn't they market it initially as like a remedy to headaches or a remedy to? Yeah, but the guy that invented the syrup, uh, Mister John Pemberton, was a Civil War uh, veteran, so to speak. He had been injured in the Civil War. Uh -huh. And it was an injury that caused him pain after. Uh -huh. He was also a pharmacist. Ah. And through his knowledge of pharmacy, he knew that these two items, the, 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 the coca leaf 
and the kola nut could possibly create something that would taste good and also help eliminate the pain. Mm -hmm. So that's, he set out to do that. In fact, coming up uh, May 8th is okay. National Have a Coke Day. Okay. Ah. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is always on May 8th, and it's because it was May 8th that the first Coca Cola was served in Atlanta, Georgia at a drugstore, at the counter of a drugstore where they put a shot of this syrup in there and charged it up. Mm -hmm. And that was on May 8th. And consequently, May 8th is a traditional day to have a Coke. But it, yeah, it was created for, as they say, for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It tasted good too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Very interesting. And uh, now uh, I want to get into how you uh, decided to start investigating uh, the Coca-Cola trail, so to speak, and how you started writing the book. Uh, but before I do that, well, actually, as you talk, and I'm going to share the uh, the website that you have, the Coca-Cola trail dot com to uh, the people that are watching us on YouTube. Obviously, if you're listening to us on Spotify or whatever or Apple, you can just uh, go to the show notes of this podcast and just click on the website, which will be right in the show notes. But go ahead, Larry. I just want to share your screen, uh, share uh, your website while you're talking. Okay. Well, actually, when I got into it, it didn't take much to realize the stories were all over the country and they were all different. You know, people, entrepreneurs back in the early 1900s are taking on something that doesn't have a track record. It's not like selling Mary Kay, here's the way you do it. You know, mm -hmm. each one of them was trying to figure out how to make it and do it themselves. And to this day, there are fourth and fifth generation families that are still bottling, distributing Coca-Cola. Um, you know, one of the interesting uh, challenges that the early ones had, and this leads to why the Coca-Cola bottle was Coca-Cola became very popular mm -hmm. and bottling, you know, you, all of a sudden you would have uh, Coca-Cola spelled with a K or you would have Chiro Cola or whatever. And to the consumer, they'd walk in the store, they'd see a bottle that said Cola. They thought that's Coca-Cola mm -hmm. because bottles were whatever you could get. So about 1905, Coca-Cola said, wait a minute. There's too much consumer confusion. We're, we're getting credit for everybody else's product. And they issued a challenge to the glass makers in the United States. We want a bottle that'll be patented, that'll be our bottle. When you pick it up in your hands, you know you've got a bottle of Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. So there were five uh, bottle manufacturers in the United States that took on the challenge in 1905. And each one of them produced uh, five or six sample bottles. Uh -huh. They went to a, a meeting of Coca-Cola bottlers. And from there, they were going to pick the bottle. Well, as it turned out, they picked the bottle that we, we know today that has the little uh, center to it, you know, and the nice design. And that bottle was manufactured by the Root Glass Companies in Terre Haute, Indiana. Now, if you ever get to Terre Haute, there's a lot of, and I write about it on my trail, they are so proud of the fact that the Coca-Cola bottle was invented, patented by a glass maker in Terre Haute, Indiana. Wow. The Root, Root Glass around? Company. Oh, well, that glass company is no more. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, Root family, the glass company ultimately, um, after I think about 20 years, sold the patent to Coca-Cola. So they, they had the patent. Um, and the glass company was bought, uh, I think Anchor bought, a couple bought, but finally it was consolidated and on it went. Mm -hmm. But an interesting story with this um, after that meeting, remember there were five glassmakers, each brought five or six bottles. Coca-Cola said all of them will be destroyed, except we want one, the winning bottle, one of those 
for the archives. And mm -hmm. it is in the Coca-Cola archives. Oh. The rest of them were to be yeah. destroyed, okay? However, however, one of them escaped. One of the winning models escaped. We found out that the uh, family that uh, of the one of the gentlemen at the glass company um, who helped design it, that he was able to keep one. He got it out of there somehow. And the family had it from generation to generation. About two years ago, it came up at an estate auction in California. Wow. I guess the family decided it's time to, to cash it in. Mm -hmm. That bottle went for over a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, we'd pick them up for two cents, get enough and go back and get a free Coke, you know, yeah, yeah. $150,000 for that bottle. But wow. that, it solved, it solved the problem. When you pick up a Coca-Cola bottle, you know it's a Coca-Cola. Yeah. So when you started writing the book, uh, it, it has so many interesting stories, as we've already discussed, uh, to it. But as you started writing the book, you already knew you wanted to have it well illustrated because I think there's a lot of illustration, a lot of photographs in the book as well, as long as this. A, as a lot the of amazing photos. Yeah, yeah and there, the photos came from so many different places. The, the families, you know, uh, that are still bottling just opened up to me and showed me, gave me photos and copies of photos. And the historical societies, because it's Coca Cola. You go into a town where Coca-Cola used to be bottled, and I guarantee you get into the historical society, you're going to find photos. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of photos that I got out of uh, historical societies, museums, and so forth, and photos that maybe were, were shown to me for the first time. Now, one of the photos I'm the most proud of is on, I think, page three or four of the first book. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've, we've made copies of that photo, have enhanced it, added color to it. And the photo is of the world's first Coca-Cola delivery man. Mm -hmm. This was in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where they first bottled it. And here's this black gentleman on a horse-drawn wagon loaded with wooden cases of Coca-Cola. Well, he was in Vicksburg. There was nobody else bottling it. He was delivering it. We took the liberty of calling him the world's first Coca-Cola delivery man. Wow, We're interesting. Probably pretty accurate. Mm. Yeah, and we've got copies of the of the uh, enhanced photo that we've made available to people just because we think it's such a such a unique uh, unique photo. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's there's a lot of history involved in Coca-Cola, and as you pointed out. A lot of towns, especially the smaller towns, Coca-Cola meant a lot to that town as it was as we were moving through the 20th century, right? Well, it not only did it mean a lot, and that's the thing that amazed me, is the 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 murals in those towns are treasures. They're historical treasures. Towns will go to great lengths and great expense to restore or preserve a Coca-Cola mural. Now, <clears throat> you you tell me another form of advertising where a, a town will spend thousands of dollars to preserve that sign on the side of a building. And mm -hmm. I asked people that were doing that, I said, why? They said, because it's memories. It's part of this town. As a child, we remember that we used to go to the Coca-Cola plant and watch them bottle the Cokes. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting one in my second book, Albion, Michigan. There's a, a, a restored Coca-Cola mural on a very old building that hangs over the Kalamazoo River. They had to spend, because of the bad shape of the building, not only the bad shape of the mural, they had to spend over $50,000 to make the building solid enough to restore the mural on. Now you're talking about, uh, you're they, talking about, you're talking about those painted, like the, the sides of buildings, like the brick buildings that had the painted right. advertising on it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and th there is, there's one in uh, Georgia that is supposedly 
the oldest, the very first Coca-Cola mural. Mm -hmm. It was painted on the side of a drugstore where right. the guy was selling the Coca-Cola syrup. Um, the syrup salesman came in one day and said, how about a, I can paint? Why don't I paint a sign on the side of your building? So, yeah, go ahead. Why not? You know, well, in his haste to paint the sign, he and it, the sign said, drink Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. He forgot the R in drink. Years later, when the drugstore changed ownership and the new owner took over, he wanted the sign restored and he hired two local artists and they sneaked the R in there. So the restored version does say drink Coca-Cola. Instead of drink uh, Coca-Cola. There's another one. <laughs> yeah. There's a, another one in um, Opelika, Alabama, where they tore down a wall inside a, a big hardware distributor type store. And they were going to expand the store. And when they tore the wall down, here's this pristine Coca-Cola mural. Apparently, it had been painted on there, was outside for two years, and they built a wall over it to, to redo this store. That mural has been designated as the oldest non-restored mural Coca-Cola mural in the country. It's beautiful. They did a big celebration, and you know the mayor came in, and Coca-Cola people came in, and so forth. It's uh, and it, that is in the first book. That story is in the first book. I have a feeling but, there's a few of those it, here in New York as well, and, and and it brings up the question: How much traveling did you do for the uh, to make this book? Um, well, because I have to also pay for my writing habit, I, I couldn't, try, you know, it wasn't seven days a week, mm -hmm. but I traveled a lot. It took me two and a half years on the first book. Mm -hmm. um, I traveled quite a bit, mostly in the South, you know, um, because let's face it, Coca-Cola started in the South. And uh, so you've got more old history here right. as you go further north. Right it becomes uh, not, a, not as old, not as fascinating, you know. Mm. So, you know, I, I traveled many states and, and met a lot of people and, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the hospitality that I was given by these people, again, because they said, you know, no one's done this. Everybody writes about Atlanta, Coca-Cola Atlanta. No one has written about us guys out here in the trenches who made it happen. Uh, and, and they just they opened up to us and so many great stories uh, in the book. There's 30 chapters and uh, each one is, you can sit down and read a chapter and get the whole story, put the book away for a couple of days, come back and read another chapter, you know. Yeah. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to go from cover to cover. Well, you actually have enough, you, you, you did enough work to uh, fill two books. Don't you have uh, Return to the Coca-Cola Trail out there as well? Yeah, what happened on that is um, after the first book came out, I would get emails. I'd see somebody at a show or something, and they'd say, "You didn't write about such and such." So mm -hmm. I'd write. I'd make a little note. Well, hey, there's Statesville. I need to look into Statesville. So I started a box. I called it the the forgot abouts box. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pretty soon I had enough of the forgot abouts box that I could do another book. Right. So I had all these leads that had been provided to me by people in the communities. So it was pretty easy to go back and do the second book. So Some they, read, it, yeah, they, read, they read your first book and saw that they were missing and they reached out to you and said, where the hell are we, right? Right. And, <laughs> and they were a big help in finding photos and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and telling stories. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing. They have this coca-cola thing you know and i've done so many appearances so many interviews if i'd have written about anything else you know i'd have been a fly on the wall mm -hmm. but because it's coca-cola mm -hmm. the, the magic of coca and i had no idea when i set out to do this that that coca-cola would bring me people like you <laughs> well, what 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 what, what what was the uh, what was the propellant that made you that made you start? What was the propellant that made you start? Just liking Coca Cola as a drink? 
No, it was the idea that I thought I had found a good travel feature oh, that's that right. I could yeah. freelance mm-hmm. and sell to somebody, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I, I, I at that time I was drinking very little Coca Cola, and uh, being from the south, sometimes just for fun, I'd have an RC and a moon pie, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> that, that old tradition. Yes, but. Um, I've got, in fact, for a while, I'd go meet with a distributor or a bottler, and we'd be sitting in his conference room and talking about the history of the company. And he said, by the way, would you like a Coke? Well, I had no choice. Of course I like a Coke. You know, really, what I'd like at that point is a bottle of water. But yeah, you have a Coke. Why not? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, I am fascinated by how Coca-Cola has stayed up with trends in beveraging you know i mean they own so many different products you know the distributors will tell me you know we've got 150 different types of coca-cola products we distribute it's not just minute made orange juice you know it's uh, the power drinks and and one i'll have to admit that i keep in my refrigerator now is the new coca-cola coffee that, I think they've got five flavors of it now. My favorite is the, the dark. And what I like to do, don't tell Coca-Cola, um, I'll take, I'll open it, put it in the refrigerator and let it get flat. And the coffee flavor comes through a lot stronger when the carbonation is pretty well deceased. You know? What's the name so, of the thing? Coca-Cola coffee? Coca-Cola coffee. It's in those those thin, narrow cans, same amount as in a big can, you know, but it's just a taller can now. And that's the new thing is these thin cans. It's Coca-Cola coffee. Um, like I said, they, they started out with four flavors, uh, like mocha and vanilla and whatever, you know, and mm-hmm. they've added a new one. And I can't even remember what the name of the new one is, mm-hmm. but I like the dark. Yeah. You know, I like the coffee. So that's... You know, thank you, Coca Cola. <laughs> found one the way. Well, actually, I never but even have, uh, tried it. My myself, I haven't tried it yet. I'll have to look for it. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, they, they bought what is the uh, not Gatorade, the other one, Powerade. You mm-hmm. know, Coca Cola bought that, mm-hmm. and they've got their energy drinks. They started um, an energy drink uh, in England. And because of their relationship here um, with the uh, Monster, okay, they had they bought into Monster and they had an agreement with Monster that they wouldn't do a, an energy drink here. Uh-huh. So it took a while for that to be resolved, and now you can buy Coca Cola energy drinks here too. Again, in those those thin cans, right? But you know. You probably have seen in the grocery store a drink called Fairlife milk, a, a milk called Fairlife. It's mm-hmm. owned by Coca Cola, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just typical. Of, they see a product, they think it's something with potential. It needs a push from somebody with a big operation, and it's Coca Cola. The Fairlife has just just boomed the past couple of years. They make uh, three different types of milk uh they make uh, the yogurt products you know it's just, you get coca-cola buy into something and you know i think the day is coming that we always see on tv after a game you know they come up with the big jug of uh, gatorade and dump it on the coach's head you know mm-hmm. well, it won't be long it'll be power aid you know <laughs> gatorade has a competition coming that's for sure well they certainly are masters of marketing there's no question about that and you had mentioned before you're not a collector but i know because my day job is uh i'm in the antique business and uh more desirable than not is those coca-cola signs those big tin or aluminum coca-cola signs from back in the 50s which i guess was their wheelhouse for those things those are in in high demand uh you got to, of course, you're in the business, you know. Um, you got to make sure you get an original because, boy, there's a lot of repros out there. There is, there are, uh, ton, ton, for every one original, there's a thousand repros, yes. The Coca Cola collectors, 
is an international organization, primarily based in the United States. Mm -hmm. They have chapters all over. They're about to have their annual convention in July in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And they will come. I, the one last year was in Baton Rouge, close by. And I went down and hawked my books, you know. Um, and it's amazing. The things that, that come in the door that people collect, if it's got Coca-Cola on it, somebody's collected it, you know. Oh, yeah. It just, and they are very active. They have their national convention. They do a monthly magazine. I contribute to it just, because they've been good to me, I don't, you know, sell them articles, but I'll write articles for them. Mm -hmm. And um, they have chapters all over the country, several per state, and they'll get together with their swap meets and their their weekend events and that. And it's it's quite a gathering. And boy, I'll tell you what, these people believe in Coca Cola and the magic of the name Coca Cola as a collector's item. Yeah, I'm looking at your website as you're talking and. I can honestly say I've never heard of uh, uh, Coca-Cola pepper jelly. Pepper jelly. That's, uh, yeah. that's a, one of my, another one of my crazy ideas. I was thinking about, I need to do something for Christmas. Uh -huh. And I've got a friend that, that makes really good jellies. And it's pretty popular here in Louisiana. He's in a lot of stores, and but he's pretty much a, you know, a, He's got his business at home. He's got a nice little jelly factory set up at home. So I went to him, I said, and he, he specializes in pepper jellies. And I asked him, I said, do you think you could do a, a, a Coca-Cola pepper jelly? So we, we tried one that was made, you can buy a cola flavoring. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's no patent that keeps you from buying a cola flavoring. So we tried that and it was okay. And then I, I said, well, wait a minute, you can buy the Coca-Cola syrup. You can go to Sam's Club or whatever, and they'll sell you a big 20 pound bag of the pure Coca-Cola syrup. Mm -hmm. So I bought some Coca-Cola syrup and I said, Try, make some pepper jelly using this instead of the sugar. And that's what's in, the, in those cola pepper jelly uh, containers. It's Coca-Cola syrup mixed with whatever jalapeno pepper and whatever he does to make the pepper jelly. I have never, I have never, I have never heard the term pepper jelly before. So I'm, I'm really coming from a point of ignorance on this. Which well, is, you down, know, down, down here at Christmas. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can see the little brochure there that shows the uh, cream cheese with the, the jelly on it. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big Christmas party time treat. Is pepper any kind of pepper jelly on cream cheese on is a it, cracker? Is it pre predominantly yeah. a southern? Is it predominantly a southern thing or? What must be because I hadn't heard of it. I got involved down here, mm -hmm. but you can find pepper jelly. You name whatever your area is, it peach or apple or whatever. Somebody's making a pepper jelly out of that, you know, whatever that flavor is, blueberry, strawberry, whatever, there's a, they'll make a regular one, you know, a regular strawberry and a strawberry pepper jelly. Yeah. And it is down here very popular. Well, after this interview, I am going to buy you, I should have bought your book before this interview, but you piqued my interest so much with your stories that I am going to buy the, the two for package. Where is it? Uh, where you can buy yeah. the coconut. The Coca-Cola Trail and the return to the Coca-Cola Trail. I might sneak in a little pepper jelly just to see what the hell it's all about, you know. <laughs> I, I think I, I think let's see, I'm looking at the, what you've sent me, and there's no address on here. If when we get done with all this, give me an address and. Oh no, I'm going to purchase Santa it on your website because I really want to read the book, and now you got me curious about the pepper no, jelly. But, so. I don't know if you do your own distribution of your book, but you'll have my address. <laughs> sure, sure enough, yes, surely enough. Oh, yeah. I'm a one-man show, Tom. All right, I, well, that's I'm good, a, you know. I'm an author, I'm a marketer, you know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the shipping department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes it gets out of, out of control, but it's yeah. been good. For, you know, there was a, a, a lady with a museum just recently, I'll give the museum a plug, Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, the Vulcan Park 
which is a historic uh, state park, uh, which pays tribute to the iron industry, which is big in Birmingham. Uh -huh. They have a museum, and they also have a very, lar very large Coca-Cola bottler in Birmingham. So you do events honoring Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. So I had heard about her, sent her a little note, told her what I had. And in the past two months, um, I just got an order in the other day for uh, 20 books. And prior to that, they had went through 30 books in two months. They've gone through 50 books. Hmm. So, you know, people like Coca-Cola. They oh, like yeah. to read about yeah. it. Well, I read the reviews on the book, and it's definitely, people do enjoy the both of them, actually. There's just equally uh, praise for the second book as well as the first. Um but you know, and uh, I like the fact that it's illustrated. I like seeing old photos of these of these, you know, bottle distributors and their wagons. And I'm sure it wasn't a quick turnaround for these guys. It must have been, you know, because think about our nation's highways back in the day. You know. Yeah. Well, and you know what happened um, because of the improvement in transportation. You know, and we, we get good roads and we get good vehicles. Instead of being all these little bitty plants, what happens? Consolidation, you mm -hmm. know. So you've, you've gone from over, I think it was around 1,100 Coca-Cola bottlers at one time in the United States, where now there's, a, there's less than 100. And it's a combination of um, modern transportation, efficiency of big production, Plus, you know, you get generations down the road where they say, you know, grandpa liked this, but you know what? We're going to cash out. Who's going to buy the plant, you know? Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of that. It's just, it's, it's the way it's, the way things happen in business, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we're down to less than a hundred bottlers, but the stories from, from 1100 plus bottlers are pretty fascinating. Yeah. Well, the and, the it is a I was going to say the bottle is in the distributors. I know Michael Jordan, when he retired from the NBA, bought a distributorship, a fairly big sized one, somewhere in the Midwest. So yeah, there's 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 one. I'm trying to think of the. Uh, it's in my second book. Uh, another NBA player bought one in Southern Illinois, and shame on me for not knowing the name. But that's true. I mean, of course, Coca Cola likes that. You know, in both cases that, you're, that we're talking about, the franchises that, that these two players bought, the individual, were actually Coca-Cola-owned franchises. And because there was someone with that name, they then turned them loose, so to speak, sold them back to an individual bottler. Oh, and sure. It's been, yeah. You know, that's, the, the real key to Coca-Cola's success has been the local bottlers the local distributors because they get involved mm -hmm. you know they build baseball parks they they, they do things in the community you know coca-cola went on a little bit of a binge back in the 70s and 80s of buying and bottling and they still coca-cola still bottles a lot you know they have their own plants but they bought up a lot of bottlers they bought one particular bottling operation that was out of chattanooga that was in the fourth generation, they bought that for $1.3 billion. Wow. But you know what they found? Coca-Cola found that they couldn't do what the local bottlers did. They couldn't get involved. You know, the scholarships, the programs, let's have a, you know, a, a, a 50 mile marathon, whatever they were doing. Coca-Cola corporate couldn't keep up with all that. Mm. And little by little, mm. certain territories went back to existing bottlers. Uh -huh. Deals were made. There was obviously a changing of, of money. And some of the territories went back to local bottlers because they found out the local bottlers could do it better right. as far as marketing. Right. Has, uh, has Coca-Cola Corporate ever reached out to you after your publication? Um, well, I've had some nice comments. I've tried, though, to avoid working with corporate because that was the whole purpose of this book was to tell the story that corporate didn't. Uh, I've been lucky enough to stumble onto some things that uh, 
that they didn't even know it in the archives. And uh, I was able to provide them some information. Of course, the book is licensed. That, one of the things I had to do is get it licensed by Coca-Cola so I could use, you know, the fancy logo and use the, the name and so forth. Right. Yeah. And at any time we, we do a promotion um, and we use the name Coca-Cola, it's as one of my bodily friends told me, it's an extension of the line. You know, you can mm-hmm. use, if you're licensed to do something with that and you, what you're doing is extending that line, whatever it might be, you're fine. Mm. So we've we've done promotions with the Coca Cola name, and um, you know, and have have had no problem. Coca, I've had Coca Cola people actually <laughs> actually contact me and buy the book. You know, so mm. um, I guess we're still in their good graces. Well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a national Coca Cola museum in the United States? Oh yeah, yeah. There is. There are. The big one is in Atlanta, as you okay. might suspect Mm -hmm. and there are two smaller ones there's one at disneyland in florida and there's one out um in vegas Uh, but if you really want to see the real museum it's the one in atlanta and uh, you know spend a day and then some it's it's worth it's worth if you're a coca-cola fan yeah there's that's where they got the vault you know that's Mm -hmm. where the the recipe is hidden away in the vault, you know, and that makes, makes a good story. Who knows? But anyhow, yeah. uh, you got to have a little tradition. You know? mm-hmm. uh, and this fellow Biden, one of the, Biden Horn, is that his, how you pronounce his last Biden name? Horn. Yeah, Biden Horn. Horn. Good German guy. He came over here and actually uh, came over. He was a boot maker for the Confederate soldiers during the civil war. Oh boy. And uh, that was a, a project that uh, obviously had a short term to it. Huh. And uh, afterward, <laughs> he got into opening his little candy store and, and soda fountain. And from there evolved, as we talked about. What, we, what country was he, he from? He was what? from Germany. Oh, Germany. His, okay. his, yeah, his, his uh, father came over and, and uh, he was uh, a bootmaker. And uh, like I say, for the, for the Confederate Army, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and of course Vicksburg. I mean, we had a heck of a battle in Vicksburg, so it would be natural that he'd end up in Vicksburg with this thing. Mm. So he was. Yeah, the there first is one. a. Yeah. He was. He was number one, mm-hmm. and there there will be a big observation uh, observance of that uh, on Coca Cola Day. Have a Coke Day on the eighth in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, and you can go to the, the re, they've restored the old soda fountain and they've got some reproductions of the original uh, bodily equipment that was used in those days. And it's, it's an interesting uh, visit uh, to see how they did it. You know, one of the things that I found, uh, and this is in the second book, that Coca-Cola logo, and you've got it on the screen there, that script logo, you know, yeah. and boy, it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, but not quite. <laughs> uh, I found in the second book, there's a story about an internationally famous wildlife artist. And he started his art career painting Coca-Cola signs on the sides of trucks, murals on the sides of grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera. And that was how he started out his art career. Well, it so happened that one time he was asked to go to Tifton, Georgia, to paint a Coca-Cola mural on the wall of a baseball park. So he goes down there, and by now he's painted that that Coca-Cola logo so many times, he tells the bottler, he said, you know, I can do that logo upside down and backwards. You know, he said, I, I've painted it so many times, and you know what? It needs help. <laughs> Father said, what do you mean? He said, it needs a little depth. It needs a little help. It's not quite right. Would you mind if I do that? The bottler said, no, go ahead, you know. So he paints a sign on the baseball wall, and uh, the bottler looks at it. There's the Coca-Cola logo, and it does stand out better. 
So he calls the guys in Atlanta. It's not that far from Atlanta to Tifton. He said, send a couple of guys up here. I want you to see this. So Atlanta sends up a couple of their kahunas and they look at it and they say, yeah, that is pretty. That does give it a little snap. Two days later, they come back from Atlanta with a big check and a contract and that internationally famous now, although he's deceased now, a uh, wildlife artist signed away his creativity of the Coca-Cola logo. Oh, well, wh what, what, exactly he did he, what exactly did he do to, to uh, perk he it up? He, he didn't change the, the script at all, uh -huh. the style. He just added some depth to it. Okay. Did, it, know, always, did it always have the bottle behind it? Well, it isn't always used that way. Okay. Yeah, but that's most, true. Yeah. You know, and what he would do as he became famous as a wildlife artist, he would go to like, you know, a Ducks Unlimited banquet or something. And they're always auctioning things off for money. You know, he'd take a tablecloth and he'd write the, he'd paint the logo upside down and backwards and they'd auction off the tablecloth. You know, <laughs> the guy was amazing. Oh, he made a couple I'm of bucks off of him. That's good. Yeah. But I, yeah. I do see to the right of that, you would... You were pointing out the logo and telling that story. I was looking at the right. I know Santa Claus. That I think most Americans are familiar with that Santa Claus uh, Coca-Cola icon. Coca-Cola created Santa Claus. <laughs> the Santa Claus we know. Yeah. In the 1920s, it was a Coca-Cola artist who decided he needed to do something about the way Santa looked. And that that's the Santa that we've adopted. You may remember, I think it was like three Christmases ago, the post office came out with a series of Santa Claus stamps. There was four different Santa images. All four of those were images that the Coca-Cola artist had created when he created the, the Santa Claus. You he, know. he created that uh, very Santa Claus that we're looking at for the Coca-Cola right. scented. Yeah, candles. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, again, it's just Coca and Coca Cola and Christmas. I always say Coca Cola kidnapped Christmas. <laughs> now they kidnap Santa. But, <laughs> you know, now, what's the big thing? The big semis that come to town on Christmas, right? And they're all decorated up in the lights and they stop and they, you know, give out Coca Cola and whatever. Santa's there to meet the kids. That whole thing started, an ad agency came up with a TV ad that showed a Coca-Cola semi all decorated up coming to town. Well, it caught on, Coca-Cola said, let's do that. Uh. So they started this Coca-Cola truck thing every Christmas. You know, that attraction is bigger in England than it is over here. Wow. I mean, the newspaper, they will post the schedule as to when the Coca-Cola truck is coming to town, you know. Mm -hmm. Another Christmas story, Charlie Brown's Christmas. Mm -hmm. If it wouldn't have been for Coca-Cola, there wouldn't have been Charlie Brown and that, and that Christmas tree. When, when that concept of that particular TV program was developed, um, Nobody would sponsor it. They said, this is a dumb idea. A bunch of, a bunch of kids, cartoon kids, you know, with a, a Christmas, a scrawny Christmas tree. Nobody's going to want to watch that. Coca-Cola said, that's a lovely idea. And Coca-Cola put up the bucks for the very first Charlie Brown's Christmas. Wow. So they saved Charlie Brown. Too. So they, they sponsored the original airing of that. Right. Mm. And the cost to make it, you know, yeah. I wonder if they did that Christmas co-op, as you say, uh, before or after Ann has a bush, is similar to what Ann has a bush does with Budweiser around Christmas time. You know, with the with the horses and the carriage coming into your town with the, you know. Oh well, yeah, you can't you can't beat those Clydesdales. I mean, that's you know that that yeah. that's as uh, iconic as Coca Cola with their trucks. No, I think that. It may be interesting. Maybe uh, I never thought about that. Maybe the ad agency said, hey, look at all the miles that Budweiser's getting out of their wagon and their horses. 
let's do something with Coca-Cola. Yeah. Could, could be. be. That may yeah. have been the spark. I'd love to know. And I'd love to find out in your third book which one was first. <laughs> but I was going to ask oh, you. I, I was. I was Budweiser. Budweiser was first. Oh yeah, because yeah. this thing with the Coca-Cola trucks—that's a, I think, a 1990s uh, when that was first kicked okay. off. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Budweiser and those Clydesdales—they've been doing that for a lot longer than that. And, yeah. and that, those are great commercials. Now, what what do you have down the pike? Or what what's your next uh, venture? Well, I am about ready to print a a a book that has really gotten me involved. In, it's a it's a Great Lakes shipwreck story. Wow. No, it's not the Edmund Fitzgerald. Okay, mm -hmm. it is the most unique, one of a kind shipwreck that ever happened on the Great Lakes. Why can I say that? Because this was 1926, and it was a ship that was leave that left Detroit, Michigan, with 240 some brand new Chrysler automobiles on board. Mm. It got into a storm off of Upper Michigan, the Keweenaw Peninsula, got wrecked on a reef out in the middle of. No, I mean, at, in the 1920s, there wasn't much up in the Keweenaw Peninsula anyhow, mm -hmm. so, and but snow and lots of it. So we've got a shipwrecked boat with 240 Chryslers and and 20 some crewmen on this reef off of this almost uh, desolate snow covered peninsula. Well, the, the book is called Shipwrecked and Rescued Cars and Crew. Not only were they able to rescue the crew, which they almost froze to death because they got lost when they finally got on land, wandering around in the snow, trying to find the little bit town of Copper Harbor, but then after the ice froze up enough around that boat on that reef, they were able to go in and chip away, you know, a foot of ice off of all the cars and, and rescue the cars. So they get the car. Now, this thing is like eight miles from this little bitty town of Copper Harbor. Which, which, right lake, the which of the Great Lakes was it? Lake Superior. Oh, Superior. Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at... Lake Superior, there's that peninsula called the Keweenaw Peninsula that sticks into Lake Superior. And at the very tip of that peninsula is Copper Harbor. In those days, a very little, little town. Mm. And they were able to get those cars off of that ship into the snow, which, you know, you're talking, for example, this winter up there, they have had over 300 inches of snow. Wow. So it does snow. It does snow. It get that lake effect, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the story is number one: we finally rescue the crew before they almost freeze to death, and how they were rescued. And then, what about the cars? They finally get the cars off of the boat. They get get it. They're able to get them into this town by driving along the shore of Lake Superior after an attempt to make a road didn't work. And they get them into this little town of Copper Harbor. And there they sit. They're lined up. You got 240 1926 Chryslers sitting in this town because the road from that little community to the nearest civilization, which is Calumet, Michigan, is like 30 miles away. And the road is not plowed in the wintertime. Okay. And the snow is 10 feet deep. So here. And Walter Chrysler, who now realizes that the cars have been rescued, he wants them back. I want my cars back. So the story is getting the cars to the little town of Calumet and getting them on a train and getting them back to Detroit. Hmm. But you know what? Not all of them went back. We have been able to find a few that for one reason or another, stayed there and there's one that's in a museum in eagle harbor that's right at the tip up there it's a 1926 chrysler it has 200,000 miles on it wow. and it was it was chopped out of the ice on that boat and it stayed 
for a variety of reasons in in uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, and one family was passed on to one family for sixty some years. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's a so the story is about the boat, about the rescue of the guys, the rescue of the car, and then the history of how this car ended up still up there at a museum. You mm -hmm. know. And you're are you you're about to go to print on that one? Yep, we, we we're going to have a a, a release up in uh, Eagle Harbor, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, July 9th. We should have it back from the printers by the first of June. Well, you know, uh, you're already you're already. I'm already learning that you you have a knack for uh, finding stories that I like to read. So, by by the time that book comes out, I'll I'll have finished the. Uh, the uh, Coca-Cola Trail and the return to the Coca-Cola Trail, which I haven't even read yet, which I'm looking forward to. So, but I appreciate your time today, Larry. It was uh, it was greatly entertaining. I had a good time, and uh, well, again, I enjoyed it. As you can tell, uh, Tom, I, I kind of enjoy talking about this stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know, well, that's you know, it, it, it's that old uh, that old radio TV thing. You know, throw me the duck and you're not going to get it back. You know? <laughs> well, that's how I know I'm going to enjoy these books because you obviously love the story. So that's the uh, the the secret ingredient to reading uh, to reading a, a book that's interesting. You know, so but I do appreciate your time tonight, and uh, to our listeners and viewers, you, you could just look right behind, right below this uh, podcast. For the uh, in the show notes for the Coca Cola Trail .com. there'll be a link to that site, and you can uh, check out Larry Jorgensen and his books, and um, we're looking forward to uh, shipwrecked and rescued too. So, yeah. thank you again for your time, Larry. Have a great well, night. I enjoyed it, and hope we get to come back and talk about shipwreck. I'm gonna I'm gonna look forward to that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.